I've prepared a presentation for you today on a very interesting subject, um, something that everybody in this room knows about. Um, by show of hands, who is on Facebook right now? Right. How many of you are on some sort of a social network? And who of you are on two or three? Absolutely. Now the interesting thing is, and the question that we ask ourselves is, how would this look in a few years from now? How would things change in five years from now? And the presentation is very much focused on that. We predict that the phone won't be so much phone anymore. Social networks won't be so much social anymore. And there is, is quite a, a significant change that is happening right now. And again, a lot of these things you probably know already. Right now, Social networking is probably, and is, according to some companies and statistics, the number one online activity, beating porn and email. And that is, of course, something that happened in the past couple of years. Interestingly enough, Facebook, and most people would know this statistic, has now more than 500 million active users. If Facebook was a country, it would have been the third largest in the world larger than the United States of America. Twitter believes it will have one billion users by 2012. And right now, time spent on social networks are growing three times faster than time spent on the internet overall. So having said that, what we did is we, we went a little bit further and we said, let's have a look at Mixit. Mixit currently, briefly, distributes about 750 million messages per day through its network. So since I've started this discussion, uh, you probably have a few million messages that's been substituted between members. Um, and of course, people that join the network. All right, so the interesting thing is, right now, social media is not just a digital paper. Social media is not necessarily just a lot of noise. Um, it might have been perceived, uh, perceived as, a, as a fad in the past. Uh, it's becoming more serious. And we're moving in a direction where social media is a multifunctional two-way communication system made up of millions of intelligent users. The word seems to spread instantly online, and the infrastructure of social media is built for millions of immediate, minute interactions. We can see it, uh, what is currently happening in the Middle East, what has happened last year in Tunisia and Egypt, um, what is happening around the world where Twitter, social networks like Facebook, is used by users not just to read, not just to understand, but to a large degree to influence what people think and what they see and what they would like to believe. And the interesting thing is, is that social networks makes it so easy. And this is what, what the next the next slide is trying to explain to us. It started all with Maslow. Maslow predicted um, and the previous speaker spoke about Maslow, that people after security and survival would like to belong. So the internet came along, it gave you Facebook, gave you uh, LinkedIn, gave you Foursquare, gave you Mixit. But still, even to belong was enough, was not enough. It was to belong to a group of people that you could associate with. And that is still driving the wonderful element of social networking today. The fact is, Social networking today is great because it spreads. If you take television or if you take radio or if you take any other medium, you probably reach millions. But once you close the connection, of course, it ends. Whereas social media on a, a normal PC or a Mac or a mobile phone, of course, does not end any kind of connection. The user in a platform like Facebook or Mixit stays permanently de facto connected to other people, to groups of people and to networks. And it spreads easily. It's this easy spring of ideas um, and sometimes propaganda that makes it viral in nature. Of course, we know today that Google long ago realized that Yahoo is not necessarily just the only competition. They have to start indexing what is happening on YouTube. Uh, the guys from AdDynamo would tell you that. They need to index what is said on other social networks because that is relevant today. And once you do a search, of course, you know on Google today, that is what you get. And of course it lasts. What is said about your brand, about you in person on Facebook, what is said about your products lasts, and people can find it, at least for a, a few years. So the tweets are fleeting. Everybody is chatting, and somewhere uh, in a dark corner in the States, Google is saving all of this, what is said today about your brand. 
And of course, lastly, it helps you get found. Social networks today helps you get found. And already we can see this uptake happening on Facebook today. The IDC projects that within the next three to five years, about 10 to 15 percent of retail will be done through social networks in developed countries. And that leads me to move on with, with the presentation, a very interesting phenomenon, and it's happening right now. So we can reasonably say, isn't social networks just part of the internet? And this is a bit of emergent thinking on our side. Isn't social networks just part of search engines or websites or blogs or commercial sites? Would it be the case? But most people would say, right now, who do you trust to give you recommendations on products? Where you go for holiday, what car you would buy, what insurance you would take? How would you go about to find product information? Chances are that it will be your close, trusted circle of friends and colleagues on Facebook. It might be on LinkedIn. It might even be for the younger generation on Mixit, where they would talk to each other about products. And they would suss out what is good, what is bad, and what would work for me. The fact is, we might be in a situation where this might happen, where social networks will, to a large degree, become a primary portal for people to access what they need. And I know this is emergent thinking, but the fact is, and I'll, I'll move on with the presentation towards Africa, what will happen with the millions that connect? And we are the opinion that this is already starting to, to occur very much on a massive scale on Facebook. Um, and we can start seeing it happening slowly but surely on Mixit. And I'll give you some examples as soon as we get to that. So today, the goal of marketing needs to be to get found by customers when they are looking and not to get into their face when they are not looking. And this is very relevant for social networks, very relevant in the sense that it is social commerce. It's social commerce. It allows people to buy when they connect. And while they connect, they can be buying. And then you can brag about what you bought right there and then with your friends. So it becomes a closed circle, a closed loop of activity um, that is relevant for developed countries, but I think even more relevant for developing countries, um, probably like South Africa, like Southeast Asia and Latin America. And uh, we draw a little picture there with uh, the Facebook like in a trolley, just to put that point across. The fact is, and let's focus just on social commerce. Social commerce is good for marketing because what it does, it provides consumers with tools, um, useful tools, to make informed choices. And social commerce helps shoppers to do smart and savvy shopping. Because now I can follow my brand on Facebook. I can be permanently connected to my brand preference on Mixit as added as part of one of my contacts. And I know new merchandise, new product lines. I can talk to my friends about the product lines that might have bought it. It might become something that is scarce. It might be something that's only there for a time limited edition. Um, and it obviously creates a whole dimension which is social commerce. It allows brands and retailers to sell where customers spend their time, as I've said. It's based on the social psychology of social shopping. And of course, we all know that there's basically six rules to social shopping, or, or, or six elements to it. And the fact is, people sometimes make decisions on a wafer-thin piece of data, and not necessarily all the facts. They would go where the masses buy, or they would do what most people would do. And of course, social networks have quite a huge impact on that. So right now, e to forecast that over 800 million people worldwide will be participating in social network via their mobile phones by 2012. 94% proportion of phone users who will communicate on their handsets via social networks, which is a staggering amount. 92% of users who have more confidence in information found online than they do in anything from a sales clock or other sources. Now, this is fascinating. This is fascinating, especially, and you, you can think for yourself, what do you do when you want to buy a new car? Or if you want to buy anything new for that matter, you probably will go to the internet first. But you will probably start to query your network, your, your group of trusted friends. You'll probably go to your social network to find out what is happening on that product. That's certainly what Mixed users do today. And that's why they decide to add Nike or Adidas or FNB or whatever brand is available on Mixit. 
So to a large degree, for the marketers, of course, in the room, if there are marketers, this is probably where the money is going. For the people that is technology driven, of course, we are in a situation, and this is no big news, a new news for us right now, but the consumer, of course, is driving technology. They are dictating to a large degree where this is going. No longer can uh, Facebook, Twitter, Mixit, LinkedIn sit back and just focus um, on what they are doing, but they have to be very much in tune with what the market demands as a result of this. Which is interesting because that brings us to one of the primary portals of how users would connect in Africa, of course, today, where we are. And I'm talking about South Africa and Africa in general, which is the phone. It's a wonderful thing. You can have fantastic applications, video recording, you can have even applications to measure your sleep to wake you up at exactly the right time in your REM, and it can make voice calls. But the wonderful thing, and we seldom think about this, and this is something that we at Mixit spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to understand the psychology behind this, is the phone itself. It's always carried. We don't realize it, but the phone is always carried with us. In studies done, about 76% of people carry their phones with them 24 hours a day within a meter's reach. And that's probably what you do. You grab your phone, your wallet, and your keys when you leave the home. That's the first thing you grab. The second thing is always on. The mobile phone is always on, except the old Ericsson 198s back in 1993. But these days, we keep it switched on. And that means that brands, businesses, my contacts, can stay in contact with me semi-permanently. Who of you have responded to an SMS 3 o'clock in the morning? most probably did, or at least you've read it, but you won't switch on the television necessarily, or listen to radio, or you won't even answer the phone. But an SMS, funny enough, you probably would respond to. What would Facebook do to us? The mobile phone is personal, of course. Unlike the PC, the mobile phone is not something that I will easily share with anybody else. Some of us prefer not to share it with our wives or our husbands. Some of it us prefer to keep it quite personal for various reasons. Um, but the fact is, and you would know that just looking at your phone and how you use it, it is personal. It's different. And of course, social networks work on that basis. The fourth point is it's a built-in payment system. Of course, we know this. The SIM card is a wonderful thing. And of course, over time, mobile users are used to paying for content. Of course, that is moving on. But the fact is they're more inclined to pay for content or services than uh, a normal internet or a traditional fixed line internet user or somebody that's connecting to the internet via their PC. Um, and of course, that leads us to a, a place where we can accurately measure what audiences are doing. They are buying things with their phones. They are either buying digital content and very soon um, when we launch our wallet by the end of this month, will be able to buy real goods with a mixed wallet with your phone at a store. Um, and we can imagine what we can do with, uh, with that kind of tracking and understanding of user behavior um, over time. And of course, the mobile phone is available at the point of creative inspiration. It's, it makes it easy for marketers, it makes it easy for businesses to say, use this device that you have with you all the time, 24 hours a day, it's always on, it is very personal, and we can tune in and be creative with it. You can take photos, video recordings, you could be creative as the consumer in using it, which again changes it. And social networks capitalize on this element. And then the last thing, and it, again, it's a bit of emergent thinking, and I've, I've touched on it, is the fact that we can now, once we start connecting phones and wallets and social networks and alpha users and second degree networks with each other, understand how people make purchasing decisions and probably what their next purchasing decision might be. Um, if we help them along the way or if they find it on their own. Which is interesting. Um, so in, in Africa, it, it, this is a, a very important part of my presentation that I would like to focus on. Because of course for Mixit, and I guess for the people in this room, Africa is important. Right now, it seems that Africa, and we all know this, is skipping a few steps. They're skipping a few steps. They are getting access to phones, it might be feature phones, the candy bars, it might be smartphones, and I'll show you just now what Huawei did, the Chinese manufacturer. Um, and they will probably discover a lot of things that we grew up with um, suddenly out of the blue, applications, the mobile web or the web. They will discover social networks and instant messengers um, suddenly, and they would have to make a decision on what they do with all this information. It's fascinating, that uh, one picture there of the uh, Kenyan is from a tribe called the Kung. And apparently, he met somebody from the United States, an anthropologist, a sociologist. 
Um, and he had a phone. She met him and she introduced them to sneakers. Didn't pay much attention. And then a few months later, on Facebook, this guy contacted her and said, next time that you're coming to Africa, we want six pairs of sneakers, please. So it happened. Fascinating. So they just extended their support, their support area from 200 kilometers to about 15,000 kilometers as a result of this. Fascinating story. So if you look at Africa, Huawei, the Chinese manufacturer of handsets, now releases the IDEOS phone for 80 US dollars in Kenya. And about 350,000 units has been sold this fiscal year, th keeping in consideration that a Kenyan, the average Kenyan is about two US dollars a day with, uh, with discretionary spend that they have available. So that's fascinating. And of course, what we're seeing here, and uh, people in this room know much more about this than I do, the fact is that phones hardware is becoming cheaper, it's becoming more pervasive in Africa, and it will connect millions over time. One billion people in Africa, 500 million have cell phones, and over 50% using phones to access the internet. And that's just now. By 2020, every single person in Africa will own a mobile phone. And they will most probably, most probably have some form of a social network running on that phone. It might be in the form of an instant messenger, moving to a social network, what might be a social network itself. So we can see in Kenya today, in East Africa, 11% of Kenya's GDP goes through M-Pesa. And M-Pesa signs up about 10,000 new people a day, which is fascinating, as a result of a lot of things, of course, banking, um, accessibility, uh, logistics. The fact is, it's becoming a reality right now. Let's look at Mixit briefly and what's happening in South Africa, which is a, which is a fascinating statistic. Facebook, and that, that figure is slightly outdated, I think it's at 4.6 million users that Facebook um, registered users have in South Africa. Twitter, probably 75,000. Mixit currently sitting at about 35 million registered accounts, of which about 11 million is active on a monthly basis. So it's interesting to see that, that this thing, even in our own country, is, is growing bigger and bigger by the day. Mixit adds about 60 to 70,000 new registered accounts every day to its user base, um, and so does Facebook, so does Twitter. They're growing on a, on a fast, fast pace. What's happening right now, uh, of course you know that, that Facebook uh, revenues are made up 11% of the credits that they sell, and most people predict, although there's controversial issues about this, it might be that the Facebook credits will overtake mo the advertising component in the next few years. Um, and uh, that is a, that's a scary thought. Mixit, as I've said, will be launching its wallet probably by the end of this month um, in South Africa that will allow users to buy value-added services like airtime, electricity, you'd be able to pay television, licenses, fines and fees. You will also be able to buy music and other digital content, and of course you would be able to uh, go to Kuwai, or if you like Hungry Lion, or uh, later on if you want to go to ShopRite, you would be able to do this. Now this is the interesting thing, because what's happening is we are approached by more and more companies, and of course we are approaching more and more companies with the idea and saying that why shouldn't we why shouldn't we capitalize on the fact that we have millions of users using Mixit every day? Why shouldn't we capitalize on the fact that they are connected to your brand every day for about an hour on average? Some of the more active users on Mixit would use it for 135 minutes a day. Why couldn't we make it easier for users? And in that case, a company like MultiChoice, of course, would like to use Mixit to go full circle. They would like to give the user the ability to buy a DTT or a DTH box. He would be able to activate it. He would be able to authorize. He would be able to clear errors. He would be able to download his guide. And he will be able to prepay his subscription on a monthly basis instead of going to a store or to a bank. And this is, uh, this is exciting. It's, it's happening right now in South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, moving towards the end. Uh, of my presentation. So I'd, I'd like to recap before we go into any questions. Uh, the fact is, we believe social networks are not so social anymore and any longer, and they won't be. Mobile phones are not so phone anymore. It's, uh, it's not just, uh, of course, a device that you make calls with. It will empower millions of people in Africa over time, and they will discover a wonderful world. 
And we firmly believe that Africa is at the leading edge of technology because it understands the user. Because we are developing, because we have real logistical challenges and operational challenges, we're much more in tune with our users and we understand what they want. And as such, we're trying to give them better technology and connection and social networks. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, um, Denny from Convergence Partners. Um, regarding the monetization of social networking, I know you spoke about um, well, Facebook moving from advertising-based revenue generation to more virtual credits and that kind of thing. Um, more, well, um, the percentages, you mentioned an 11%, and I imagine advertising, I imagine there's still other forms of revenue generation within a Facebook model or, your, or the Mixit type model, and I'd just like you to speak to that if you can. Of course. Uh, just thanks. I think what, what I'll do is, uh, thanks for the question, on, on Mixit's side, I think most people would know that uh, how social networks monetize is on advertising first. They introduce brands and products and services to their, their client base in quite a unique way. Um, and for that, of course, brands are willing to, to advertise. Brands today understand that it's better to stay within the social network and not leave it. And that's an interesting thing because most big brands like Doritos, for instance, would not leave Facebook. They would rather stay within Facebook and not say, go to our site or go to Facebook or which one do you choose? So advertising revenue is very important. Um, on a platform like Mixit, it would be to, of course, get visibility and penetrate the user base, and then, of course, to have real estate on, web, on, on Mixit where you can do various things, digitally or offline. The second component, of course, is um, what Mixit did, which is micropayments. Uh, we essentially said that the uh, way in which we will monetize a user base is to sell uh, let's call it premium content, or let's call it entertainment, because uh, users have that requirement today. They had it a few years ago, where we gave them the ability to credit their accounts with a virtual currency called Moolah. And the way that they do that is they basically send a premium rated SMS, a short code, to the operator. We share that short code with the operator, and we credit the user's account as such with an amount of credits, which we then sell against and of course we retain a very small margin. So of course we need gazillions um, of transactions to, to make this viable. Um, so that's, the, that's the, the third option. The interesting thing in Southeast Asia, and that's only restricted to Southeast Asia, um, we do have a scenario where we share data revenue um, with, uh, with an operator in Indonesia um, and probably in the Philippines very soon. So that, that's, that's of course a unique one. And then of course on the wallets, which is a whole different discussion, but I think that's the, uh, that's the three big uh, models that's currently being used um, by ourselves. Hope that answers the question. We have another question here. Hi there, Jan Vermeulen from my broadband. Hi. Um, wanted to ask about your wallet. Um, you mentioned the uh, M-Pesa in Kenya doing so well. And we have various mobile wallets uh, operating in South Africa, some of them linked to specific banks, some of them linked to specific operators, and some of them sort of operating um, cross-platform, uh, I want to call it. Um, but none of them really seems to have gained the traction that we see from M-Pesa in Kenya. In, yeah. in South Africa, M-Pesa isn't even doing as well as Correct. that. Correct. Why is that, and will Mixit's wallet be, be any different to what we've seen in the market right now? Um, some, some details there would be greatly appreciated. Of course. Thanks. That's, that's an interesting and a very good question. And of course, we spend a lot of time talking about it. But I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to speculate. Um, I think the, the first element, of course, is the cost of getting money into the wallet. That's, a, that's a, real, a real scenario that consumers need to deal with. The cost of getting money in, and of course, the cost of getting money out, and the cost of distributing money to whatever you do. So we're trying to, to focus a lot of our attention. If we could give it away for free, we would, but we can't. So that's, of course, something that we would like to address is, is the fee structure behind this. The second element, of course, is the functionality within the wallet and how it interacts with your brands and your services. So we're trying to make it um, a valuable service to the user. The model we're trying to explore is focusing on why can't a user get discounted products and prices on the platform right there and then? So if you have a budget of 100 Rand or 200 Rand to spend on food this week or today, 
why can't we give you uh, product prices and products from ShopRite or Checkers or Spa or Pick and Pay or whatever it is right there? Why can't we give you an idea what to do with that 100 Rand? Why can't we give you an idea of how much discount you can get? Or why can't we give you a discount on your next purchase uh, within Mixit? So the idea is, because of what it is, because the user has, and let's use a theoretical example, pick and pay connected to my trusted contacts. So it's very much like your phone book. You go down the list, you say, pick and pay. I want to see what's happening in pick and pay. There I have my purchasing options. Um, and of course, we're talking about a, a younger user base. We're talking about an emerging, emerging user base. So we hope that those two elements um, will certainly make a difference. I hope it answers your question. I hope it makes sense. Indeed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the merchants um, that, that you're going to get on the platform when you launch? And um, do you have like a specific launch window? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the first, I, I'd like to steer away from mentioning merchants. Um, I think what we want to do is keep it for the day that we launch. Uh, we made a decision with a mix it not to, to be too open in the market about that for various reasons. We just want to keep it like that. But the fact is, let me give you the categories of merchants that, that will be there to give you some guidance. The first thing that we, of course, uh, will focus on is, is fast food outlets. It's uh, companies that could be Kauai, it could be... Uh, Hungry Lion, it could be a lot of fast food outlets that we would like to target. The next line is, of course, uh, your retailers. It would be something like the Engine uh, Quick Shops. It might be uh, ShopRite Checkers. It might be Spar. It might be Pep. And, of course, Pep has got their own suite of products. But that's the first categories that we would like to focus on. Of course, it's hard work to integrate with them, to get into their point of sale and to integrate effectively. So uh, that's currently the plans. The launch window, right now we are in, uh, in beta testing the wallet. So it is, in effect, live. We're playing around with it. And we hope that within the next two weeks or so before October that we would be able to put it to market. Joan, I have a question. Yes, yep. Just uh, in the early days of Mixit, there was a lot of stigmatism associated parents and children, look what you made my children do kind of thing, which is obviously nonsense, but a stigma is there. Yes. Is that mostly gone? And did you find any similar experiences in the other countries we expanded into? Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a valid question. I was waiting for that. Thanks, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's... We have several discussions with the press corps and, of course, serious companies um, in the financial sector and other sectors about uh, what is happening with Mixit and uh, some of some of the uh, the bad press that we got. Of course, um, to be fair to the press corps, uh, in the past, Mixit was quite a was quite a popular a popular brand name to use in connection with, with an article. So if something happened on Mixit, somebody disappeared, or I really met my date or something actually worse um, happened, unfortunately, in some cases, then they used it in press, and um, it syndicated quite quickly. Uh, we think at that point in time, back in 2006, 2007, yeah, it was still early days. People were just discovering social networks. They were discovering instant messaging. Mixit, of course, was uh, there before Facebook, and it was there before Twitter. So people suddenly discovered this new thing where I could meet somebody that I'd didn't know before. I could know and understand who they are intricately and I can actually meet with them. But the fact is that one of the, the, the critical errors that the press made was they, um, they didn't fully understand how it worked. Uh, it was practically, and still today, is practically impossible for me to have a relationship with anybody in this room without you giving me permission on Mixit to do so. So it's only when both parties agree to that interaction that that is possible. And of course, we are trying a lot to educate our users. Don't be silly about this. But we believe over time, as the market matured and as the industry matured, people do understand now that social networking and messaging is very much the fabric of our lives. It's integrated with what we do. Um, I believe last week the United Nations declared internet access a human right, a basic human right. Um, so it's it's. Uh, it's, it's there. The fact is, it still occasionally it does happen. We believe the press and Business South Africa is quieting down about that and as a result of the industry maturing. But Mixit would spend a bit of time, hopefully um, in the next couple of months, to reposition itself a little bit stronger um, for South Africa. 
Did you find that in other countries as well? Um, no, not, not really, not really. Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia and the Philippines, we haven't really uh, had uh, a situation like that. I think, again, if we look at it, Southeast Asia is, uh, is of course, I won't say more developed, but I think the, the market there is so well in touch with these things. If you think about Tencent's QQ or MiG-33 or Nimbus, you might know some of these brands. These guys had it by the time that Mixit went live in South Africa. So they were slightly ahead of us. Um, and uh, so we didn't have any problems there. Thank goodness. Interesting. Thank you. All right.